This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. And trust me, dear listeners, you're going to want this book. So it's finally available after 20 years. It's the third and final volume of the biography of Churchill by William Manchester. As many of you probably know, William Manchester wrote the first two volumes. They were absolutely amazing. Um, And then he started doing the research on the third and started writing the third one. But then he was afflicted with Alzheimer's. And so it just sat there for years. And then he um, asked Paul Reed to take over. So that really the book is a combination of both of their efforts, but it's really amazing. Um, I wish I could say I'd finished it, but it's 53 hours long. I've just started it. But again, all the detail is there and they do a really good job of saying, here's Churchill who certainly wasn't anything more than human, but he's helping his country go through one of the darkest periods in its history. And he's trying to be everything to the people that they need. So he does that. But then again, as the war ends and the power starts to shift from Great Britain to the U.S., he has to recognize that. Churchill has to recognize that and help his country deal with that transition. So it's it's just an amazing story what Churchill had to deal with during the war and after the war. And they do a really good job of covering it, uh, Paul Reed and William Manchester. So trust me, you want to get this book, go to my website, click on the Audible link. Um, it's absolutely free. I don't think it gets any better than this. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 63, October 1940. By September of 1940, one year into the war, the various high-ranking military men and politicians had learned a few things about Adolf Hitler. Like when he was on, his instincts were a marvel to behold. But when he was cross, he could be as petulant as a child, with the power of life and death. And by the end of September, Operation Sea Lion seemed unlikely to happen that year. This was Hitler's first real defeat, and he wasn't taking it very well. So, treading on dangerous ground, the German naval staff decided to choose this time to approach their temperamental leader and put forth their case. If the invasion of Great Britain had to wait until the spring of 1941, perhaps the intervening time could be used to weaken Britain further in the Mediterranean. Hitler listened, but unbeknownst to the men talking, every time they said the invasion of Britain, he substituted invasion of Russia. And in his head, what they were saying made sense, but for his purposes. Action taken in the Mediterranean would keep the British busy and off balance. Furthermore, any success there would shore up his southern flank as his armies moved east next year. By the time the men finished their presentation, Hitler was as content as he could be, excepting, of course, that his panzers were not closing in on the outskirts of London. This line of thinking prompted the Nazi warlord to ask Mussolini to meet him at the Brenner Pass, a pass through the Alps in northern Italy, on October 4th to discuss their Mediterranean policy. But the meeting, with hindsight, was noted more for what was not said than clarified between the Axis partners. Hitler did not discuss his Russian plans and kept up the pretense of invading Britain next spring. Mussolini matched his partner's black heart by again declining the Fuhrer's offer of air power to engage the Royal Navy and panzers to support Graziani in Egypt. Sure that Mussolini was going to say yes, the 3rd Panzer Division was already preparing for desert conditions. Also, General von Tomas was sent to Sidi Barani to size up the situation. His report was not flattering to the Italians. But the kicker was that the Germans could not expect regular deliveries from Graziani's shaky supply lines. And now that Mussolini had said no for at least the second time, the 3rd Panzer Division now found itself preparing for Operation Felix, the taking of Gibraltar. It was time to move that particular project 
forward. So on October 22nd, Hitler met with Laval, the Prime Minister of Vichy, France, at Montois. But really, this was just a stopover on his way to see Franco at Edige on the Franco-Spanish border. But it was worth seeing what might the Vichy government might be willing to throw his way against the British post-Dakar. Hitler left Montois feeling that Vichy help may be possible next spring. Again, it's always good to have options. As the Nazi leader headed south, his desire for Felix was reinforced by what Admiral Rader reminded him would be the outcome of a successful operation. It was only a matter of time before the U.S. came into the war, and having taken Gibraltar from the British would help German U-boats prey on Allied ships in the Atlantic. Furthermore, having the base in Spain would mean having a location where German resources were out of the range of British aircraft. This made an impression on Hitler, as Goering continued to have his nose bloodied over southern Britain, as Raider knew it would. Lastly, politically speaking, one more setback for the British would only reinforce any anti-war groups in Britain. But here, Hitler's arrogance or blindness to the situation in Great Britain, now under Churchill, deluded his thinking. So, taken altogether, speed was paramount, and a date of January 10, 1941, was set for Felix. By the Germans, anyway. But the meeting with Franco started badly, and quickly went south from there. Hitler arrived at the train station, expecting the normal pomp and ceremony for when two leaders met. Then he expected to hear Franco's, and frankly Spain's, appreciation for everything Germany did for the Spanish leader during the Civil War. But not only was Franco not there, waiting for the greatest conqueror since Napoleon, he must have been busy attending a course on how to upset a Nazi leader, because every utterance from the Spanish leader wrangled the master of Europe more and more. First, Franco reiterated his desire for French North African territory. But that, Hitler could not agree to, in light of the meeting he just had with Laval. So, let him down gently. Then the Spanish leader predicted, in his best parade ground voice, Hitler was, after all, only three feet away from him, that Britain, with help from the U.S., would take the best that Germany could dish out and remain standing. Not exactly the way to end up on Hitler's Christmas card list. Now, partial credit for this observation by Franco goes to the American diplomat Michael Rocklin, who reminded Franco that American and British goods were the only thing keeping Spain from hunger this winter. And if Spain lined up with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, well, it was hard to see the Allies continuing that support. By now, Franco had to notice the Fifty Shades of Purple in Hitler's cheeks, because he then made the observation, if Germany could support Spain after it lost supplies coming from Hitler's enemies, but Hitler had to answer this passive request in the negative. To his credit, Franco tried again. What if Britain was conquered? Wouldn't that make this decision easier for Spain? But Hitler knew that would not be happening this year, which, of course, was the main reason for this meeting in the first place. It must have been hard for Hitler to listen to the rambling of this man. He was used to doing all the talking and being obeyed without hesitation. The only time he had to listen was when he met with Mussolini. When they met, one of them would talk and talk and talk, not daring to take a breath, because then the other would seize on the silence and launch into their own speech. They both hated not having the floor, but had somewhat gotten used to tolerating the other's voice. But this was something altogether different. Not only was Franco saying the wrong things, the way he said it was aggravating the Fuhrer's last good nerve. As Hitler listened to this man tell him no, two thoughts crossed his mind that he later shared with his general staff. One, he would rather spend an hour in the dentist chair than have to hear this man for another minute. 
And two, Franco seemed like the perfect model for a Nazi portrait of Jewish manhood. How they must have laughed. The meeting ended with the Cadillo flatly refusing to sign Hitler's protocol for Felix. So, the leader of Germany then decided nothing could be lost by showing his revulsion for the beggar leader from a beggar country. So, the central Mediterranean was being denied to Hitler by Mussolini. And now, the western Mediterranean was closed to him by Franco. Suddenly, the Balkan route, which his supporters offered as an alternative to attacking Russia next year, seemed more favorable. But the situation there and the effects of invading the Middle East through the Balkans deserves a quick explanation. Before France capitulated, it and Great Britain were only the core of the Allied cause. There were other allies, active and passive, and one of them was Romania. But hoping to save itself after the fall of France, Romania joined the Axis. But this about turn only angered her neighbors, Hungary and Bulgaria, even more as it was their contention that Romania benefited more than they did from the Treaty of Versailles in terms of acquired territory. As Hitler knew, one day he would be marching east, when was just a detail, and he needed the east calm until he was ready to disturb that peace to his best advantage. So, in stepped Hitler and Mussolini and offered to mediate all claims. The Romanians were hardly in a position to say no. But, right out of the gate, the Soviet Union insisted on taking Bessarabia and most of Bakovina. Now, it was the Axis partners who were hardly in a position to say no. The last thing Hitler needed was Russia overly concerning itself with its western border. So, he let it go, hoping the Russian bear was satisfied. But there were other powers to appease. In Vienna, after a round of conferences, a large portion of Transylvania went to Hungary, and the southern Dubroja went to Bulgaria. I'm sure I said that wrong, but I couldn't find anything on Google Translate. Anyway, everyone was satisfied, except Romania. But Germany and Italy promised to protect the remainder of the Romanian state. However, there was no way King Carol's government could survive this humiliation, and in early September 1940, his government fell apart. In stepped the pro-Axis government of General Antonescu, who did not hesitate to ask for military assistance from Germany. Hitler, concerned with peace in the East, for now, was only too happy to oblige. But in reality, his troops were there to protect the oil fields and prepare for the day when Nazi divisions moved further east. On a side note, Hitler forgot to tell Mussolini about the troops, but Mussolini matched his friend by forgetting to forewarn him in October that he was going after his own part of the Balkans, i.e. Greece. So, returning from Montois, Hitler and Horror found out about his partner's latest attempt at an acquisition and had his train diverted to Florence. The train pulled up on October 28th and Mussolini, unlike Franco, was there to meet his friend. He met Hitler with the shout, Fuhrer, we are on the march. So Barbarossa, an idea still in Hitler's mind, was adversely affected. The East was disturbed. But then again, so too would be Wavell's Operation Compass. October was also a busy month for the British as well, but in a more positive light. By then, the last two tank regiments of the 7th Armored Division had arrived. The Desert Rats were now at full strength. The 4th Indian Division would be at that same status in a few weeks. The relative good news good news only because Graziani hadn't moved yet, was that O'Connor's Western Desert Force was growing in numbers, but also in competency and confidence each day, as they were put through their paces. And behind them, between Mursa Matru and Alexandria, training just as hard, was the 4th New Zealand and 6th Australian Divisions. They were the last line 
before Egypt proper. But the one piece of information that would have made Wavell smile, if he ever did smile, was that the 7th Royal Tank Regiment now had 57 of the heavy eye, or infantry tanks. And during all this, O'Connor was not out making speeches or sharing jokes with his men. Instead, he drove around, covering every place his troops were at, looking over maps, continually evolving his plans as more information came in. Basically, his alert aggressiveness emanated from him, and his men picked up on it. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash worldwar2, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash world war two right now. Shopify.com slash world war two. Wavell, glad of the reinforcements, knew it would soon be time to act. The Duke of Aosta in Italian East Africa had a large and therefore dangerous force, but Graziani had to be dealt with first. So, on October 18th, Wavell ordered Brigadier General Dorman Smith, Commandant of the Wartime Middle East Staff College in Haifa, to spend a few days with O'Connor and the Western Desert Force, assess the commander and his army, and reply back on the feasibility of attacking the Italians soon. Dorman Smith was a friend of O'Connor and Wavell, but knew his duty. He came back on the 22nd of October, and reported that the outcome of a push would probably be successful. As usual, Wavell said not a word, but simply opened a drawer and pulled out a directive for Jumbo Wilson and O'Connor to prepare for an attack. He had just finished writing the memo. However, the directive specified a limited five-day raid and suggested to O'Connor to split his forces and hit the Italians on both flanks. O'Connor received the directive and was pleased for it, mostly. He wasn't keen on the time limitation, nor the overall suggested approach, and certainly shied away from splitting his forces. The coordination between the two would have to be perfect, or they would end up being swallowed piecemeal by the larger opposing force. So O'Connor sat down with his officers at Bagouche in their underground operations room and considered the coming raid. Wavell's idea did not take into consideration that the area near the Italian's right flank, the one furthest from the sea, would be bad going for tanks. So, O'Connor abandoned the overall suggestion straight out. O'Connor decided it was best to take what they knew of the Italian dispositions and formulate a plan of attack around that. The Italian 10th had established itself in a series of camps from the coast to about 50 miles inland. The closest camp to the British was at Maktila, on the coast about 15 miles east of Sidi Barani. From there, a line of uneven camps angled away from the British for 50 miles inland and ended with the southernmost camp of Sofafi just south at the end of an escarpment where the ground rose and made quick movement impossible. 
located at Sidi Barani, the headquarters of the group of Libyan division, was a black shirt division, well-trained, confident, and radical fascists. Behind Sidi Barani were the 21st and 23rd Corps, totaling about five divisions. As for Italian equipment, the British were able to, with reconnaissance during the night, determine that good news laid here. The Italian light tanks were so thin, even British anti-tank rifles could penetrate them. And as for their heavier models, their main guns were fixed, so that the entire tank had to move to adjust its aim. The bad news for the attackers was that there were some of the newer models of heavy tanks that had a revolving turret with a 47 millimeter gun and machine gun. But of course, it was the Italian artillery, easily the best trained part of their fighting machine, that concerned the British. Here, the Italians had them at a two to one advantage. The other considerable Italian advantage O'Connor had to factor in making his own attack plans was the Italian Air Force. The British were heavily outnumbered here, and if their approach was spotted, their forces would be caught out in the open, and Longmore would be able to do little about it. The question was, how intensely were the Italians keeping a watch out? But there were also other unanswerable questions. Like, for the British, this would be their first real offensive on their own since 1918. How would they do? And while O'Connor was pleased to have the heavy eye tanks, they were untested. How would they do? Still, he and his staff gathered information and formulated their plan. Graziani's weaknesses were the following. Their distance from the British was not great, which would enable O'Connor a decent chance to sneak up close with a little luck and prepare an attack. Next, the Italian camps sprinkled about were too far away from each other to offer real support if one or a few of them came under attack. So, his plan was coming together. The British would sneak up as close as they could and take advantage of the gap between the Italian camps separated by the escarpment. The southernmost camps would be kept busy, while the front-line camps would be passed by and hit from behind. But here's O'Connor's plan in more detail. The Camp Nibewa was the southernmost of the Italian camps north of the escarpment, so British forces would pass by it to its south and then swing back north and attack from the west or behind. Meanwhile, other British forces would continue on north of Nabewa and attack the Tumar camps, again from the west. A third force would continue even further north until they came upon Sidi Barani along the coast and attack it from the south. The only Italian fortified camp east of Sidi Barani, Mactila, would be attacked directly from the east along the coast by a separate force called Shelby Force after its commander. This would hopefully draw the attention of Italian forces in Sidi Barani to the east as their real attackers came from the south. Back at the escarpment, two other battle groups would head southwest. One would place itself at the end of the escarpment, protecting their previously mentioned comrades' southern flank, while another, larger force would attack the camps just south of the escarpment. Lastly, a large group would continue to head north by northwest towards Buck Buck, west of Sidi Barani, again along the coast and they would take an Italian field formation along the way. This last group, if successful, would cut Italian communications from Solom still further to the west. If all went well, the advanced Italian units would be scattered, captured, or cut off from retreating. In essence, a major raid, just as Wavell wanted. On November 2nd, Wavell accepted this general plan of battle, but on the condition that it remained a five-day raid. Then the Western Desert Force was to retire to Matru. O'Connor was delighted, not that he showed it, and began with his staff, his race of dwarves in the desert, as he called them, to plan out the even smaller details. But as O'Connor focused his attention on his maps, 
He realized that what they had come up with would only achieve mediocre results compared to what could be. Suddenly, a vision of total success came to him, much like when an entire chess match reveals itself to a player only after the fifth move. Before him, O'Connor saw a way to completely push the Italians out of Egypt. Of course, it would take more than the five days given to him. Operation Compass was taking shape. As stated in the previous episode, Churchill was only too willing, now that a German invasion seemed unlikely that year, to send Wavell and Longmore supplies and men. But the Prime Minister was feeling restless and wanted action. To his thinking, either Wavell acted against the Italians, or he would act against Wavell. Anthony Eden, the Secretary of State for War, stuck in the middle, between understanding Wavell's reluctance without the means and Churchill's need to strike at the enemy, suggested he go to Cairo and visit the Commander-in-Chief Middle East, and Churchill agreed. Eden arrived at Wavell's office on October 15th. When Eden arrived, Wavell, Wilson, and O'Connor had been sharing their delight over the performance of the heavy I infantry tanks, also called Matildas. The light and medium tanks, which had proven to be mostly ineffective during the Battle of France, could not be, unfortunately, redesigned at this time. It was deemed best to produce mostly Matildas and a smattering of the lighter tanks. Again, having some of them was better than having none, and that's what would have happened if time was taken to thicken up their armor and add a larger turret gun. But here is where Wavell's experience in World War I affected his desire to communicate his intentions to anyone besides those directly involved in Compass's planning. This even included the Secretary of State for War, along with his Prime Minister. Also, Wavell ordered Wilson and O'Connor to commit nothing to paper. Today, with perfect hindsight, it's hard to fathom Wavell's ultra-need for secrecy. But active officers in 1940, who fought in the Great War, still remembered the distrust that rose between themselves and the politicians. And in particular, the recall of Corps for the offensive plan for Amiens on August 8, 1918, which allowed word to get out that something was afoot. The result of his experiences during that time heavily influenced Wavell's decision to not tell Eden or Churchill the full story. Instead, the commander-in-chief Middle East ordered Wilson to inform the secretary when Eden visited him only of their backup plans for deflecting the Italians if and when they came at Matru. Still, as the plan showed to Eden had as their goal the destruction of all Italian forces that came Matru's way, the secretary was impressed. He then contacted the prime minister and asked for another battalion of I-tanks. But, as far as Eden knew, the plan was for an offensive against Graziani in January 1941. Going back a bit to what we've already covered, what the Secretary of State for War did not know was that on October 20th, Wavell sent off his order to Wilson and O'Connor to develop a plan, with a recommendation for a two-pronged attack, the very plan that O'Connor would reject before making his own. In short, Wavell wanted a raid, a major raid, but still, something that would only hit the Italians and cause them to repel. There would be no British follow-up. But this planned raid, combined with Churchill's restlessness, O'Connor's insight, and Mussolini's many mistakes, would evolve into a larger plan called Operation Compass. Thus, having given his generals their orders, Wavell and Eden then flew to Khartoum, one of the largest cities in Sudan, to discuss with Governor General Jan Smoots, the fourth Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa, the situation in Italian East Africa. The Duke of Aosta's forces there had to be dealt with, but wrecking headlong into Wavell's plans, not to mention Hitler's plans, was Il Duce. On October 28th, Italian troops moved from Italian-controlled Albania into Greece. 
everyone on the European and African stage now had to readjust their views, plans, and strategies. The events of Dakar did not take the fire out of General Charles de Gaulle. It did hurt his prestige, as well as his value to Churchill. But, as much as was possible to any man who has reached the rank of general, his tarnished prestige mattered little, as long as he could continue the fight over French interests. He could, and so he did. Moving on with his idea of restoring French honor, between October 8th and the 12th, de Gaulle met with his staff at Douala of French Equatorial Africa, modern-day Cameroon, and finished up the details for an invasion of Gabon directly south of them. But not stopping there, nay, trying to recreate the very definition of the word boldness, de Gaulle considered using Cameroon, once Gabon was taken, as a jumping-off point for an attack against Italian forces in Libya further north. He, like Eden and the Prime Minister, did not know the truth of Operation Compass. This meant going through Chad, but that seemed not to bother the focused general of the Free French. But not wanting another Dakar on his record, de Gaulle himself, after the Gabon plan was made, went to the Cameroon-Chad border to gather intelligence. And on October 27th, Free French forces crossed into Gabon and took the town of Mitzik. It was the beginning of a time of reverses for Vichy France and also of the Italians. And for Mussolini's armies, it would stay that way until Rommel came. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank everyone who's entered my replica newspaper contest. So again, just send me an email. Let me know that you've given me a rating or review, and I'll put your name in the drawing. Um, the, the drawing I will be doing on December 8th, and then I'll contact the winner and get the newspaper out to them just as soon as I can. Also, I'd like to take a moment and thank those who have donated. Uh, Andrew E. from Prude Ho, Northumberland in the UK. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Sorry. And then Chantelle G from Quebec, Canada. So again, thank you very much. Um, I've got a guest speaker lined up to help me with naval matters in the Mediterranean in 1940. So hopefully I will be able to interview him next week or so, which probably will require very little editing. So I'll get that out to you as soon as I can. Also, another thing I have uh, planned is a, a short episode on the D-Day Memorial that, that, that I went to. So if you never get a chance to go out and see it, I'm going to try and break it down uh, piece by piece and explain everything. And I'll put pictures up and that kind of stuff. So I'll be putting that out as uh, soon as I can. But with the holidays coming up, who knows what's going to happen. So, um, and thank you to everyone who's been voting for me on the podcast awards, which means you're voting against Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast. But hey, them's the breaks. So I'm sure we're both going to lose. But again, it's just fun to be part of the parade going by. So um, I'm working on episode 64 I will have the interview with that gentleman out soon and also the D-Day Memorial. And then we'll, we'll try to wrap up 1940 and then I'll go back and cover what's been going on the, in the Atlantic um, as soon as I'm able to increase my knowledge of all things nautical. So again, if you know of any books out there, drop me an email, let me know, give me all the help you can. So I hope you all have great holidays if I don't hear from you uh, for a while. And uh, as usual, take care, everyone.